grace and mercy and peace to you from God our Father, the Lord Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. I have a, a bit of a, it's called, they call it a residual cough. Not a symptom, it's a residual, sometimes it comes on me and that's why I have a glass of water. Please don't be alarmed by that. So over the last uh, few uh, weeks here in the Sundays and the days after Epiphany, the appointed gospel readings have all been, and still are tonight, from the first chapter of Mark. And in this first chapter, once Jesus starts ministering in this first chapter, there is just a flurry of exciting activity. But it all takes place in a very specific context. The context of disease, of demon oppression and darkness. And our reading tonight has got still more examples of this. Jesus and his disciples have spent their morning in the synagogue service. And what happened in that service was the topic of last week's reading. Uh, after the Sabbath service, they walk over to Peter's place for a meal and, and to rest. Peter's wife, and that's interesting, right off the bat, the apostles have wives. Anyway, uh, Peter's wife almost certainly had scooted on ahead to get things ready and also to get there to minister to her sick mom who wasn't well enough to go to church or anything. From the way that Mark uh, describes all this, it, it does not sound like it was much of a distance to scoot or walk. The synagogue and the house sound like they're pretty close together. And Mark would know this uh, because uh, in the years after Christ's resurrection and ascension, um, Mark wrote down his gospel from the preaching and from the reminiscences of Peter, Peter himself. He knew Peter really well. He'd probably been in this very house, Peter's house, a lot. As, by the way, uh, had Jesus been in that house a lot when he was in Galilee. Peter's house there in Capernaum seems to have served as a bit of a headquarters, or at least a gathering place for ministry while Jesus was in Galilee. Anyway, certainly Jesus was uh, much loved and welcomed in that home. But I'm losing the, the thread of the action here. Let me get back. So on that Saturday morning, after the extraordinary Sabbath service, they're all walking down the street to Simon's house. And yeah, it says Simon in the reading, but I expect you all remember that Simon and Peter are the same person. Peter was the nickname that elsewhere Jesus gave to Simon and that stuck and I'm gonna use the name Peter, okay. So they're walking along and they, to the house and they tell Jesus something that he already knew, that Peter's wife's mother was sick with a fever. As Soon as they get to the house, Jesus pops inside and goes to where the sick woman lay. He takes her hand and he lifts her up. Simple as that. At once, the fever fled. Gone. Of course it was gone. That disease would vanish at Jesus, that, that, pardon me, that that disease would vanish at Jesus' touch is no more astounding than that demons would flee at his word, which is what had happened at the synagogue in the morning. And these things are meant to open our eyes our eyes should like stretch wide so that we see something. They're meant to show us something. That Jesus is concerned with and is king over the physical world. Not just the spiritual, you know, not just demons and spiritual stuff, but he's king over the physical world. And he doesn't just claim to have that authority, he gives clear proof and exercise of that authority, showing that he has real power over sickness. Just a touch of his hand and that fever was cured. Well then what? Well I actually, I love these, uh, these homey details. The woman who was healed, that older woman, she's, she's, she's now, she's healed, she's up and about now. She's straight into the kitchen. She's appearing with bowls of food for the guests. You can just imagine how much it had bothered her that friends were coming over to her house and she was too sick to welcome them or do any hospitality. But now she's healed and she's back into what she really cares about, that everybody be taken care of properly. Once healed, she could do it. It says in the text there, she began to serve them. 
And the home is taken out from under an anxious cloud to being a place now of hospitality and a relaxed conversation. They would have spent the afternoon relaxing and resting. Because, you know, the Jews take the commandment about Sabbath rest seriously, and they would have not have worked that afternoon. But the day comes to an end. When? Well, in the way they mark time, not at midnight, we, we have the days changed at midnight, not them, changed at sunset. At sunset, the Sabbath was over, and that was the moment the people of Capernaum, the town they're in, had been waiting for. Obviously, word had run through the town because Peter's house was suddenly besieged. The whole city, writes Mark, was gathered together at the door. They stood there in one vast, diverse group, eager for miracles. They knew their need, or the need of the person they brought along, and had heard of Jesus. They found out where he was, and they'd come. They looked eagerly for the Savior. Each case presented before him. Cases that fill our medical books. Pe people with <coughs> ailments that had no name, or that had a name but no cure. They were brought to him. And the great physician, whom they'd come to see, did not lose a single case or charge a fee. As for the demons, the foul spirits, Christ's blazing holiness exposed their abysmal wickedness, and his unquestioned authority exposed their stolen strength. He silenced them even as he expelled them. People, I'm saying, were just being set free, left, right, and center. Enough miracles were performed that night to fill a book. Enough miracles to satisfy even the most hardened skeptic. Never in history to that point had the world seen the like of what happened that evening outside of Peter's front door. Well, the next morning, nothing was more predictable than that people would go on seeking him. Jesus was was breaking the darkness. That's a, a few hymns we have in our hymn book. I use that terminology, I like it. He was breaking the darkness right there in their town. The people were increasing with hope. However, really early in the morning, Christ had made himself scarce. Verse 35 says that while it was still dark, he departed and went out to a desolate place and there he prayed. He prayed. Jesus needed guidance for the day. He needed to hear from his father. In the, in the Gospel of John, a couple of places, he says, I don't do anything that I don't see my father doing. I don't say anything that the father doesn't give me to say. He needed to hear from his father. To concentrate in prayer, he needed solitude and silence. And by the way, so do you. Jesus was not going to get that in Peter's crowded house, not with the mother-in-law up and about, lighting the fire and starting breakfast, etc. So he left his cell phone under his pillow and went out somewhere to be alone and to pray. Obviously, he did not leave his cell phone anywhere, but that is exactly what you and I have to do or forget about it. Peter and the others wake up and they go searching for Jesus. Finding him, they say, Everyone's looking for you. In other words, <laughs> we've got another tremendous day in front of us, Lord. Things are starting to build. Last night, that was amazing. Things are really starting to roll. We can easily see how you will in no time be the most popular, powerful man in Israel. The kingdom you keep talking about, it's on, let's go. But Jesus says, uh... Let's get out of here. What? Uh, let's, let's go on to the next towns. And they're like, what? Oh, oh, we get it. So you can do even more healings over there. And Jesus says, no. So that I may preach there. For that is why I came up. Those were his words. Preach. 
He wants to go to these other towns so he can preach there also. Preach. Give a message. A teach. Good news. Preach. I am certain Peter and the others just did not get that. They didn't get that. In fact, I, I don't think they got him. Not at all, at least not at this point. And frankly, we may not get him either. What Peter wondered is easily the same thing that we wonder too. Namely, if Jesus is putting the devil to flight and bringing healing to so many desperate people, why not just keep going with that? Or let me try and update this a little bit to where we are. I have seen, personally, I've seen plenty of people get excited about Jesus, at least for a while, uh, get excited about him when in answer to prayer, he got them out of a crisis. Okay, so if he's getting you out of a crisis and he's answering your prayers and he's kind of beginning to make your dreams come true, why not just keep going with that? He says he's got the power to do it. Just keep doing that in my life, Lord. Why bog it all down with preaching? I'd like to try and explain that to you. And to make it as clear as I know how, I'd like to try and help you understand three things. I think if we understand these three things, it's going to come together. Three things are Jesus' method, Jesus' mission, and Jesus' message. I think if we understand that, his method, mission, and message will get him. So let's start with his method. Jesus talked about, but did not only use words to disclose the nature of the kingdom of God. What a tremendous, good, life-giving, and powerful kingdom it is. Yes, he used words for this, but key to his method was that in addition, he used God's power to demonstrate God's love. In compassion, he reached out to instantly heal those who were sick. Peter's mother-in-law raises her up, okay, and so many others. He rescued on the spot those who had fallen into evil's grip. His words went together with his deeds, deeds of compassion and of power. His words declared God's kingdom was at hand, and his deeds demonstrated this was no mere talk. It was so. That was his method. But what was his actual mission? And this is our second point. His mission was not to heal as many people as possible. That's some people's jobs. See Dr. Burgess in here, wonderful physician. There's hospitals, they, they have jobs like that. That was not Jesus' mission, to heal as many people as possible. And, and that's the part we don't understand. Why wasn't it? Jesus' mission was to deliver the earth and its people from the enemy and to bring them into joyful communion with God. As I explained in last week's message, if you didn't hear it, it's still, still online. Uh, this planet and its people have been infested with, enslaved to, and ruined by evil, by spiritual forces, I'm saying, that are beyond human control, whose headquarters are in hell. Hear this clearly. Hell torments this earth. Now, and I don't mean by that people who've gone under the earth. You know, we always think of hell as being, you know, down below. I don't mean just that. I mean people who are living on the earth. Hell is tormenting them right now. You and me and everyone. The torments of hell are active here and now. And the mission of Jesus is to get the hell out of earth. Obviously, banishing unclean spirits was a particularly visible demonstration of Christ's purpose and authority to do that. Which is why the last, very last verse of our gospel reading this evening says, and he went throughout Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and casting out demons. <clears throat> but here's the problem. How does Jesus get the hell out of the earth without getting rid of you and me. 
The reality is, you see, that you and I have got sin and hell in our hearts. We do. Have you ever read this little section from the letter of James? James was Jesus' half-brother. We have a letter from him. It's in the New Testament. In chapter 3, he says, James says that the human tongue is a small thing, but it does great harm. He says, quote, the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. He goes on, the tongue is set on fire by hell. And it starts a fire that influences all of life. In other words, hellfire is not something experienced only by those who go below, as it were, but something destructive at work in human lives now. Like your life and my life. Thus Jesus' problem, which is his mission, is to get hellfire off the earth without getting rid of you and me. You know, you and I, or maybe I should just speak about myself, but I probably more people than just me, are often inclined to a kind of law and order approach to the evil we see around us and in others. A law and order approach, we think. For example, I'm sure, I have no doubt, we would all agree that the selling of children into sexual exploitation is a great evil, destroying the lives of millions of kids in our world. And many would say that the perpetrators of this horror should be dealt, dealt with as harshly as possible and that God himself should punish them without mercy. Yes. And Jesus himself wants this hellfire off the earth, as we do, except that he goes even farther. He wants lust off the earth. The hellfire of lust, which is the underlying problem. Lust looks at people as sexual objects to be exploited for my pleasure, rather than as precious people to be loved. So if Jesus takes a harsh law and order approach to everyone who harbors lust, who's going to be left? That's why Jesus is not here to condemn and to banish sinners, you and me, as he does demons. He's here to save you. To save you, he's got to get hell out of your heart. But that cannot be done with a law and order power move or else you and I would be crushed and destroyed. It's got to be, instead, a persuasive move, a relational move. And to accomplish that move inside us, God uses his word, preaching the gospel. But please understand something. I know this. The word preaching is not a, doesn't have a great reputation. A lot of people equate preaching with laying down a lot of rules, a lot of moralizing, and advice giving. That is not what Christian preaching is about. It's about the gospel, it's about, which means good news, not advice. News, good news, not advice. Now listen, the, uh, the essence of other religions is all about advice. I'm telling you what you, got, what you got to do to fix yourself up so that you can get back to God. And you got to make it happen. Keep these rules, do this meditation, do all this stuff to get yourself right and get back to God. Advice, advice, advice. But Christianity is not that. Christianity, not advice, it's essentially news because it tells you what God does and has done to save you. Then let's get on to this third point explicitly. The third point being Jesus' message. Jesus says, and he shows that the kingdom has come. The king has come. He hates evil. He hates hell. And he loves you. And he's got a way to restore you to God. The forces of evil seek death for you. Death in every sense, spiritually, relationally, emotionally, and finally physically too. They seek death for you in every sense. And they have the right to, to inflict that misery because you've sinned and you've rebelled against God. I have too. But God in Christ has come to save you. To save the rebels. He humbled himself in love. And he let 
the for he let, he permitted the forces of evil to put him to death. Why? Because his death was being died in your place. He took your death. He took it in every sense so that with him having taken that out of the way, you could go free. Your death's been died by him. Now you can go free. Christ paid for you so the forces of evil lost their right to own you. You are forgiven. You're beyond now the accusations and claims of the kingdom of darkness. Rather, you now belong to a loving God and have been transferred to his kingdom, kingdom of love and light and life. All this you find out from his word, from preaching, and when you receive its truth by faith, when you put your trust in this truth, it becomes effective, powerfully effective in your life. Through his word, God causes a miracle to happen. He causes a new believing you to be born inside of you. A birth happens inside you. You've heard of being born again? This is what I'm talking about. A spiritual birth. This believing you, this new person, loves God and delights to serve him. This believing you is not set on fire by hell, but flows with living, refreshing water from heaven. Now listen, there, there is a complication. I want to make this, if I, don't, I think if I don't deal with this, I think I need to deal with this. There's a complication. Because the old hellish you, what, what the Bible sometimes calls the old Adam, is actually still inside you as well. When the new you was born, the old one didn't go. So you're gonna have a problem with this old you for how long? Till your funeral, when your flesh will be gone and that will be the end of Mr. Hyde as well. Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde, you know the story? The hellish you. On that day, your believing soul, the believing you, will go straight to paradise. But until that day, you've got both heavenly Dr. Jekyll and hellish Mr. Hyde inside you at the same time. You need to understand that about your experience and how insane you seem to yourself. You're not insane. You're born again, but you've got the old one inside you. But know this, by hearing God's word, by doing what Jesus would do, going off and be alone to pray and have time with God and that kind of thing, exercising your faith, the heavenly you is greatly strengthened and is guided more and more. You know Christ personally. You know, relationships, they all grow. Your relationship with Christ grows. And you start to act more and more in kingdom ways. Loving and serving. Forgiving as you've been forgiven. Doing good works of all kinds. Showing generosity. The new you lives in a loving, worshiping, conversational relationship with the king of love. Which is to say, in communion with Jesus. It is the mission of Jesus to get this life, this relationship started in you and in other people, as many as possible, to sustain it and to grow it all to God's glory. That's his mission. It becomes our mission too. So what about healing? What about healing? Well, Jesus does still heal today. In answer to prayer, he does great and encouraging things. As well I know. I am standing here right now preaching and not on a ventilator in the hospital or worse because people of this church prayed long and earnestly to the king of compassion and power. In answer, he reached out his hand to me. Often that hand looked like the hand of a doctor or the hand of a nurse. Or sometimes it might have just been this, this un, un, what's the word I want? Just the Holy Spirit himself acting directly on me. But he reached out his hand to me and I am alive and almost all better. This is a congregation which knows about praying for healing and that God does answer. I'll tell you though, we might do more. We might do more, and I think we should think about it. People, you know, I think we should think about having a way for people to be prayed for for healing right here in our worship services. 
I say that because Jesus went about preaching and healing and, and, and dealing with evil. He just put it all together. Why don't we put it all together? We could, how, how could we pray for people here in worship? I don't know. We'd have to work it out, the details. I know we want to do it. We could do it. It's kind of the, the details. Um, I, I have some time. Don't take this as this is going to happen. I'm just to tell you, I'm thinking about details. When I look at that space over there with that unplayed piano, I'm thinking, couldn't we move that piano upstairs and use that as a spot where someone, people who are, like, had some experience in praying for others could pray for people after communion or something? Just a thought. I'm just trying to find ways to say, how could we bring the preaching ministry and the healing ministry all together? Let's think about it as a people. Jesus is with us. He'll guide us. But I want to finish it by saying this. I have been healed and I am on my way to recovery from COVID-19, but I will not always be healed of everything. And neither will you. I have Mr. Hyde lodged in my flesh and so do you. Thus flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of heaven. It says it right in the Bible. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of heaven. That's why. Hyde can't go there. Okay. But in order to go to paradise, we shall have to lay our flesh down. Nonetheless, thanks be to God, heaven has already, hell can break into our lives, heaven breaks into our lives, has already come down into our hearts as a result of Christ's work for us. And we begin to taste its sweetness and feel its power and its fire. I mean the fire of love and, and holiness, even now. And at last, by God's grace, we will go to paradise, leaving hellfire utterly behind. Further, one day Christ will return in glory. And when he comes, he'll bring paradise with him, bring paradise with him to the earth to renew the earth. Earth and paradise, when he comes again, will be together. Read the end of the book of Revelation. They'll be together. And to live in this wonderful new place, you and I will be given new bodies, sinless resurrected bodies. I do pray for healing, and I do pray for the healing for others. But what I just described there, the resurrection of our bodies in the world to come, that is the hope which thrills us, lifts us, and to which we press. As the creed puts it, the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. Amen. And now may the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus for life everlasting.